I welcome you all to the Think7 Summit here in Berlin. My name is Claudia Schmucker. I'm head of the Geoeconomics Program of the German Council on Foreign Relations in Berlin. And I have the honor to moderate today's high-level plenary session. This panel deals with one of the most challenging issues that we are facing today, which is how to promote a cooperative world order in times of war. Russia's war against the Ukraine has dramatic humanitarian and security consequences. In addition, it also has a negative impact on other global challenges like food security, like open trade and resilience, global supply chains, climate change or energy transition. But, and this was also mentioned before, the war also takes its toll on the work and functioning of multilateral organizations and informal global forums. There's a danger of a more permanent fragmentation of the world into geopolitical blocks. So even though a common approach to global challenges is highly needed, international cooperation is no longer self-evident. The German G7 presidency now has the difficult task of addressing the immediate challenges posed by Russia's aggression on the Ukraine, but at the same time, it needs to make sure that the long-term key global challenges do not fall off the table. We have five excellent speakers for this very difficult topic who I will introduce briefly before each statement. Each of the speakers has five minutes and I will try to be very strict about this. And then I would love to open up the floor for discussion and I hope we can answer many of these questions. Our first speaker is Ambassador Günther Sauter. Thank you for coming. He is Director General for International Order, United Nations and Arms Control and Federal Government Commissioner for Disarmament and Arms Control at the Federal Foreign Office here in Berlin. Ambassador, we would be grateful if you could speak about Germany's G7 approach towards the Russian aggression in the Ukraine and the impact of this new geopolitical situation on the German G7 agenda. You have the floor. Claudia, thanks so much. Um, this is the T7 format. We are chairing the G7. I thought it would be nice to start this debate with seven arguments. And I would like to um, say, first of all, that I believe that the war in Ukraine has truly reinforced the sense of purpose that we share in the framework of the G7. And probably the same holds true for German foreign policy um, in its entirety. Now, here comes my first argument, and I'm trying not so much to say what we should do, but to describe what we are doing. I think one of the things that we have been doing from the very beginning of this war is to be very clear on our principles. Wolfgang Schmidt has just um, made the case that making the distinction between autocracies and democracies is probably not getting it right. My distinction would be between those who stand for the rules-based international order, like ourselves, and those who don't. So clarity on principles is my first argument. My second argument is I know many of you believe that we are still having a hard time in transposing such principles into actions. I would argue, you're certainly right, it's always difficult, but speaking about Germany, we have made progress in the last couple of weeks and months that I still find absolutely mind-boggling. I don't think that the Russian president would have expected us to be able to do so. I don't think that we ourselves would have imagined, even in January, that we would have the courage in terms of <clears throat> delivery of arms, in terms of really muscular sanctions, in terms of transfers of financial means for Ukraine, and so on and so forth. My third argument is um, we are working hard to strengthen our resilience. This has very many dimensions. For Germany, the 100 billion euro package for defense and capabilities is just one element. 
Um, we have a new discussion, and this holds true for Germany, for the G7, the EU and others, on strengthening cyber resilience. There are many arguments of that. Maybe the most important one is we have a whole different foreign policy discussion. I personally be believe that right now we have the foreign policy discussion that we should have had in this country for years. My fourth point, solidarity. The um, Russian government is deliberately using hunger as a weapon in the war in Ukraine. And um, it is our obligation, and I think we are politically very well advised to show to the world and to prove to the world while Russia is causing a dramatic hunger crisis in many parts of the world, we are not part of the problem, we are part of the solution. The proof of the pudding will be in the eating, forgive me the metaphor, um, uh, we now have to show that we can deliver on these issues. And um, this will not only be important for humanitarian reasons, it will be of vast political significance. And this leads me to my fifth argument, solidarity. Um, I remember one of the first um, trips I did with our foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, was in March to the UN General Assembly, where under uniting for um, peace, the General Assembly overwhelmingly condemned the Russian aggression in Ukraine. This was, I believe, truly a moment of uniting for peace, an unexpected sense of unity in the international community. We have been able, thanks to God, to maintain this sense of unity as weeks and months have gone by. It is increasingly difficult, we will come to that, um, but I believe it must continue to be one of our top priorities here. This is not the West against Russia, this is, in my mind, those who stand up for the rules-based international order against those who are trying to destroy this order. This is what we're speaking about. This is why we don't only need unity in the G7, in the European Union, in NATO, we need it in the United Nations as a whole. Um, sixth point, just very briefly, the narrative. Um, there is in the United Nations a very lively debate going on about food security, about energy prices, about debt, about the repercussions of the war on the global south, mainly. And we must make sure that this argument is not won by those who tell fake news, who um, uh, share propaganda. Um, Russia and others, other very important members of the United Nations, are trying to convince the membership that it is Western unilateral sanctions that are to blame. Um, we had a conversation with the Secretary General of the United Nations last week, and he said, the argument is fraught. Um, the responsibility for everything that is happening lies with Moscow. That's it, full stop. We have to make this argument. We have to um, be convincing, and this in connection with um, Solidarity on our part is very, very important to maintain the upper hand in the global debate that we currently have. My last point is on sustainability. Sustainability, I know, it's seven arguments, five minutes. Um, last one, sustainability. This was originally very high on the agenda of the G7. It continues to be. Um, with good reason, I would say, we must continue to work on climate. We must continue to work on overcoming the COVID crisis. The G7 have just endorsed yet another COVID action plan. We're on it. I hope that in Petersburg, there will be additional steps forward towards reaching the 100, million, the 100 billion um, climate adaptation um, threshold. 
sustainability will be very important for a whole lot of reasons. It will be very important for one more reason. Um, we are a couple of weeks into this war. We don't know how long it will continue to be on the absolute top of the agenda. We have to continue to be able to make foreign policy. We have to be continue to be able to come to agreements within the broad membership of the United Nations. Um, this will make it necessary, above all on climate, to come to agreements and to develop a way in which, to a certain extent, we compartmentalize our relationships also with Russia to be adversaries on very, very, very important issues on the one hand, and to be in a mode of operation in which we don't allow Russia to spoil key um, international processes like the one on climate. Thanks so much. Um, it's more seven minutes than five minutes, but I think it very much fits the concept of my little intro. Thank you so much. Um, I would immediately hand over to our second speaker, Natalie Tocci. Thank you for joining us virtually. She's director of the Istituti Affari Internazionali IAI in Rome. Last year, IAI held the co-chair of the Think 20 during the Italian G20 presidency, and, Japan, um, and Italy will also take over the G7 presidency after Japan. Natalie, thank you for joining us. My question, how has the international security architecture changed as a result of the Russian war? And what cooperative actions are needed by the G7 and by Europe to address the Russian aggression? Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I wish I could be with you uh, in person, but at least I'm, I'm, I'm there on the screen. If um, I hope you all see me and, and, and hear me correctly. Um, so let me be um, very, very brief. I mean, uh, sort of first, first remark that I wanted to make is, is really the fact that I think that this war has not, quote unquote, only upended uh, European security and the European security architecture. It has really upended the fundamental principles of the existing multilateral system. And what I mean by the existing multilateral system is the multilateral system that was established after the end of the Second World War. Uh, and the fundamental principles that lie at the basis uh, of essentially the UN system, which really revolve around uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity. Now, of course, uh, you know, in the decades since the Second World War, sovereignty and territorial integrity have been violated many times. <laughs> superpowers like the United States, of course, um, but we have never seen anything that resembles the invasion uh, of Ukraine today. Now, I think this kind of raises really fundamental questions, you know, to what extent does exiting, uh, likely exiting, in my view, if, if, not, if not probably certain exiting of what we have known as a post-war era, meaning post-Second World War era, into a new era, a new era which we don't know if it's a pre-war era, if it's an inter-war era, we don't quite know by definition what it is, but we know that it's no longer the level, even a very basic uh, sort of predictability and certainty that characterized the post-war era. Uh, those basic sort of, you know, that, that very basic level of uh, reciprocity and trust uh, in the international system uh, has really been uh, upended. Um, now, I think this has to do with the UN system. I think it also has to do with those organizations. And of course, here I'm talking about more recently established organizations like the G20 that essentially try to capture the way in which power was shifting uh, within the international system and therefore establish perhaps more informal institutions that try to capture uh, the power shifts and power changes, which really characterize and have characterized the last couple of decades. So uh, I think the difficulty is that in many respects, we were headed right in this direction. And in many respects, one could look at actually last year, 2021, as a year that began tracing a me method. It began tracing a method which in many respects actually started precisely in the G7, so amongst a group of so-called like-minded countries, 
which established a degree of consensus on whether it's uh, taxation of multinational companies, whether it's on climate change, uh, whether it's on vaccines and, and, the, and, and the pandemic, they then tried to enlarge this consensus within uh, groupings, which was still uh, relatively uh, small, but more representative, like precisely the G20, and then try to bring that consensus within the even broader and more formal uh, international organizations, be it uh, COP26, if we're talking about uh, climate, uh, be it the OECD, if we're talking about taxation, be it the WHO, if we're talking about the pandemic. And it looked like, um, it, it basically looked like a method was, was there in place, right? Now, th this war has even upended that method that we were beginning to essentially crystallize, uh, I think, last, uh, last year. And I wanted to really end by raising, I think, three sets of challenges, which as uh, European countries uh, at, and in the context of the G7 in particular, we really have to, I think, address moving forward. Now, the first one has already been raised, and it's really a question about uh, the narrative and the story that we're telling. To what extent uh, do we, and, and how do we avoid falling into the quote unquote trap of the West versus the rest? This is the, precisely the trap that Putin wants to, uh, us to fall in. And, and we have all interests in telling a story in which there is indeed a division. Uh, there is, if you like, the, the West, which is actually not really the West, I mean, given that we're talking about Australia and Japan and you know a host of other countries. But anyway, let's say in shorthand, we call it the West, even if we, it's not really the West. And there is a, uh, an extreme which really sees, in a sense, Russia, North Korea, Belarus, uh, uh, Syria, and frankly speaking, not much else. And then there is a rest, and in this in this rest, there are many shades of gray. Uh, there are countries like China, which indeed politically are very much aligned with Russia, but where economically, I think there are spaces in a sense of maneuver, and we have an interest in understanding what uh, spaces of maneuver there are there. There are then countries like India, which again, you know, so it, you know, in that. Uh, let's say area, vast area of gray, there are many different gradations, you know, that we really have an interest in, the, in, in unpacking. And this has to do on the one hand with storytelling, but on the other hand, I think with two sets of other issues, which in many respects are even uh, more important because they are the precondition in the sense of actually getting the story right. Now, one has to do with our resilience, and what I mean by resilience here is our ability to endure pain. Now, you know, I think that what we're seeing is that whereas at the beginning of this war, there seemed to be a relative high degree of willingness to endure pain, but as the war grinds on, and it will grind on, um, we're starting already to see the cracks in that endurance and therefore in that resilience. And we see it very painfully in our incredible reluctance to move forward uh, on energy and in particular energy sanctions. Uh, and so there's a question of, if you like, pain endurance, you know, to what extent are we really willing to pay a cost mm, uh, for, for those violations, for those principles that, that we stand for? And big question marks are, I think, being opened here. Then Natalie, think, could you wrap up? Yeah, I'll just give you a couple more minutes, I'm sorry. Not even that. Uh, la last point that I wanted to make. So if the endurance to endure pain is one aspect, the uh, willingness to take risk is another. It's all very well and good to say that we have to be, uh, you know, enlarged to food security and to economic questions. But unfortunately, the precondition for that is taking responsibility for security, right? I mean, we're talking now about getting the grain out of Ukraine. Well, frankly speaking, we will not be able to get the grain out of Ukraine only by land. Uh, we will only be able to do it uh, if we're willing to actually take the risk of breaking a sea uh, blockade, which is being imposed by Russia. Are we willing to take that risk? And here I'll, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> 
thank you so much. I think you've raised a couple of very interesting issues, and I think we will come back to that in the discussion. I now want to introduce the third speaker, Jeffrey Sott. He's a senior fellow at the Patterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C. He's one of the leading trade experts in the United States and has also been working extensively on sanctions. So, Jeff, thank you so much for coming over to Berlin to join us for the Think7 Summit. How do you assess the G7's response to the Russian aggression, particularly with regard to sanctions, and what further actions or trade actions are needed in your regard? Thank you. Well, thank you, Claudia, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to come here. It's a great pleasure, pleasure to be back in Berlin. Uh, very quickly, I think uh, I would say that the sanctions so far have had a mixed success. Uh, there are four basic objectives that sanctions seek, both in terms of foreign policy and domestic policy. They seek to dissuade the target country from the actions it's planning to take, to demonstrate resolve to domestic audiences that it will uh, stand up to international outrages. It will seek to deter these actions from happening or happening again and it will seek to damage or punish the target country for the international actions it has taken. And I would say that so far there have been pluses and minuses on, on the way the sanctions have been implemented. On the dissuading, obviously, the severe warnings that were issued to Russia before the invasion weren't sufficient, weren't clear enough, they didn't convey that what was really going to happen. Now, there's a delicate balance on how to do that without allowing the target country to evade the sanctions. But clearly, Vladimir Putin misinterpreted uh, what was going to happen and was taken back and uh, uh, by the strength of the actions, the unprecedented financial actions taken by the Western countries. And also, I think, by the unity of purpose and policy among the Western allies. That is, 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 is very important. In, in terms of the, uh, the demonstrate resolve, once the governments acted, and it really took the invasion to precipitate the major actions, because re recall just three months ago, when there was a big debate here about whether to cancel the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. That was going to be the big action to deny future uh, purchases, additional purchases of gas, not cut off and, and wean, wean away from, from Russian uh, energy supplies. That's changed dramatically. Uh, governments acted decisively, but even then the public opinion uh, changed very quickly and pushed the governments to act even faster. The outrage from the information that was available on what was happening in Ukraine I think contributed importantly, and a valuable lesson on the, on the sanctions and on the, on the policy against Ukraine is the importance of objective uh, information to allow public opinion to be informed and to respond and, and guide uh, the, the, uh, the policies of their governments. Uh, the, uh, the sanctions haven't deterred, and indeed there's a concern that's, that if, if not uh, s successfully pushed away, Putin will continue uh, in, in, uh, in Ukraine and neighboring countries. Uh, and there's an open, uh, he did that after not being deterred when sanctions were imposed against him in 2014 and 2015. Uh, the deterrence is not against just Russia, but against other countries that might seek to use military force against neighboring territories. Uh, and uh, that, that uh, is an issue that hasn't been raised today, but is important on the G7 agenda. And the damage to Russia is, is absolutely clear and punishing, uh, and will be continuing and having a deepening effect on the Russian economy. Russia will become much more autarkic, uh, and its productivity growth will be diminished, uh, and uh, this will have a long-term and negative impact on, on the uh, conduct uh, performance of the Russian economy. So uh, I should note the notable success in policy coordination, ensuring that national policies are complementary. Uh, this has been critical to the effectiveness of the sanctions. So let me uh, 
just finally uh, uh, address the last part of the question you raised, Claudio, on what else can be done. Uh, not that much on the trade and financial front, uh, because financial sanctions are already constraining a substantial array of commercial relations with Russia. And that will, will, will continue, certainly as long as Vladimir Putin is in, is in power, and even after military hostilities uh, 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 are, are ceased. Uh, the sanctions will be continued as well with regard to export controls. I think once you have, uh, have done what the Russians have done, uh, the war atrocities, the war crimes, there has to be uh, uh, some, some uh, reconciliation. Uh, to uh, and responsibility for what what has happened and the export controls uh, done effectively by the G7 countries by uh, 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 South Korea and, and and a few others have been very effective in blocking the flow of shipments of high technology goods machinery to Russia that is having a debilitating impact not only on the Russian military but on the industrial complex in Russia. And, and that is, is part of the reason why Russia is gonna suffer economically for years to come for what its military has done. But there is more that needs to be done. Uh, Western countries have frozen the uh, assets of the Central Bank of Russia, but they need to seize those assets. Right now, they're just being blocked from being returned to Russia. But in a, in a sense, there has to be action taken, and, and this is already proceeding relatively quickly in the United States, to seize the assets so that they would be available to distribute for reparations and refugee assistance. Uh, there are legal hurdles to do so, and some fear there are systemic risks for taking action, particularly uh, against the central bank's assets held in foreign countries, but this is not a normal case. This is a case where there, have been, there is a, 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 a brutal war and war crimes uh, that have to be, uh, again, uh, uh, responsible for. So we, 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 we need a firmer institutional basis for the coordinate, uh, policy coordination that has been achieved to date. And this is what, what I, I, I think I'll finish with. It's critical. This is something the United States and the European Union have begun to talk about in the TC uh, context, but it needs to be extended to other countries. Uh, to ensure that there's an enduring response to discuss the broader dialogue with other countries and how, how to address this important issue of, of uh, redress for the war crimes that have been committed. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, I had a lot of difficult questions for you, so thank you for sticking to the time. Our next speaker is Nicole Deitelhoff. She's executive director of the Peace Research Institute Frankfurt and a fellow at the new institute where she's involved in the program the future of democracy thank you so much for coming and this immediately leads me to my question Democ democracies are increasingly under threat we heard that also today um, and therefore put the german g7 presidency put stronger together resilience of democracies as one of the main priorities how do you see progress on this issue against the backdrop of the Russian invasion? And maybe if you still have time with the five minutes, uh, how do you see a change in the status of the role of the G7, which characterizes itself as a group of like-minded democracies? Thank you so much. Thank you. So I think um, apart from everything else that is being said over the Russian invasion into Ukraine, it is also portrayed as a war of democracy against autocracy, sometimes even as a war between freedom and extinction. And uh, this kind of, uh, I would say, Manichean understanding of this war um, might well mobilize many in the short term to defend Ukraine and democracy alike. It might even mobilize some to increase the resilience of democracy, but only in the short term. I think in the long term, it begs more problem for increasing the resilience of democracy than it has solutions for it. I think what the resilience of democracies mean is that we need more integration than mobilization. We need to make democracy an attractive model again for others to join in this model and not an exclusive club of arrogant power and double standards, because this is what it is perceived in many parts of this world right now. 
So what does that mean for the G7 to increase the resilience of democracy? And I think there are three lessons to take from this. The first one is increasing the resilience of democracies means start at home. So start with the G7. Many countries in the G7 think about the United States, France, Italy, or Germany have ample experience with democratic skeptics, but also with um, anti-democratic movements and forces during the last years. On the other hand, they have also been the target of um, destabilization strategies, not exclusively, but prominently from Russia. So there are two areas in which the G7 need programs to foster the resilience against this attack from the outside, but also to foster the democratic fundaments from the inside that is increasing, for instance, democratic cultures, democratic rights and freedoms, which are not in the best of all uh, stages in all of these countries. Now, align with that, then we can also start to think about having programs from the G7 for the rest of the world. So helping other countries in defending against attacks from the inside and in increasing the fundaments of their de uh, democracies in the inside. But the basic lesson is take the same medicine that you want others to take. Otherwise, it will not work. It will not become um, attractive. Now, um, coming then to the third lesson, I think that one should take home is make sure that entanglement does not get out of control. Now, the Russian war in Ukraine has accelerated strategic discourses on and materialized disentanglement already in economic terms of Russia from the West. That is the decoupling of deeply integrated or at least highly asymmetrical value and um, supply chains as well as networks with regard to critical infrastructures and resources. Now, um, this disentanglement, I think, is, is very, very important because it is necessary to prevent future or destroy already existing um, weaponized interdependence, as is currently visible in Russia's use of its energy resources and exports, but also has been visible in China's use of its um, mobile um, technology or actually in the US strategy of use its prominent position in the financial architecture. Think about the secondary sanctions regarding the Iran nuclear agreement. But the problem is that we need to make sure that this kind of a controlled disentanglement does not turn into a wildfire of destroying indiscriminately all kinds of interdependency, not only in the economic sector, but as well in the cultural sector and in political terms, because actually we need interdependencies. We need an entanglement with the Russian society, with the Russian economy, to even have a form of constant communication basic understanding, at least of the motives and interests of the other side, but also of developing stakes in one order and not in several one. So not to arrive at the fragmentation that Herr Schmidt already talked about earlier today. And actually, these kind of interdependencies coming back to sanctions, they are a basic prerequisite to make sanctions work at all. We need interdependencies if we want to sanction effectively other states, right? Without interdependence, no necessary uh, sanctions at all. Now, um, if this entanglement gets out of hand, an us versus them logic will also get more dominant which means not only that there might be an increase in the resilience of democracy as they are forging their ties, but it will equally well, and maybe even more, also increase the resilience of autocracies because they need even more to join forces. And that means that we will not, in the long term, increase the resilience of democracy, but rather decrease it. So we don't need a club of democracies, but we need a club for democracy, like the club for the climate and not of climate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I will now want to welcome our last speaker, Jose Rizaldamui. He is Executive Director at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Jakarta. CSIS Indonesia is officially mandated for the Think20 process during the Indonesian G20 presidency. And Jose is also Executive Co-Chair of the Indonesian T20. So thank you so much for joining us today. We would be interested in hearing your perspective on how to promote a cooperative world order in times of war. And I think it is particularly difficult for the G20. It's a very diverse group. We heard that throughout the morning. Uh, Russia is a member. How do you see, think the G20 can cope with that? And how do you see a, a type of cooperation with the G7? 
Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. It's a very difficult uh, question indeed. But before going to that uh, uh, response to that questions, I think I need to uh, say my thank you and appreciations to the organizers for inviting me to be here uh, to the Think 7 Summit and to be back uh, in Berlin again. Uh, as other pre uh, already uh, speakers already previously uh, point out that the uh, we are facing uh, many challenges from recovery from the pandemic uh, the ec economic consequences of the war in ukraine and also the prospect of geopolitical polarizations uh, the de deterioration of multilateral governance and uh, a patchy path actually of uh, for sustainable developments uh, and we still need a lot of collaborations uh, in order to do that um, uh, and g20 in my opinion is the right platform uh, to pursue and uh, to promote uh, such uh, uh, agenda um, because uh, the, uh, as we know that the g20 uh, uh, try to put forward the, the interests of all countries not only the advanced economies but also uh, dev uh, developing and emerging economies that can uh, also convey uh, some uh, message or some interest of the less uh, less developing uh, countries uh, however uh, we know that the uh, as Claudio mentions that the the political pressures on G20 are actually immense. Uh, G7 and several advanced economies, uh, we uh, I have to uh, say that uh, put pressures uh, to exclude Russia, uh, and it already uh, had divided uh, percep perceptions uh, in the G20 when the uh, Indonesia as the host country uh, uh, um, refused. Uh, uh, to uh, follow uh, 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 such pressures uh, and perhaps also other developing nations in G20 have the same opinions. Um, but we cannot let uh, G20 fail. I still believe uh, that the multilateralism and, uh, is the only way forward uh, and it requires uh, active participation of the rest of the world. Uh, uh, the, and only G20 uh, can internalize and represent that's emerging economic interest. So I would like to raise several points that might encourage uh, greater collaborations between G7 and uh, other G20 members. Uh, the first, uh, to echo what already mentioned uh, earlier, it is important to come up with uh, urgent and practical measures for dealing with some issues uh, that, that uh, basically uh, on the interest of uh, all uh, countries at the moment. Uh, it might include uh, food and energy in insecurity uh, due to the war uh, and also the climate situations. Uh, others also include uh, the, how to deal with the increasing financial instability uh, due to fiscal and debt service uh, burden. Those are issues that are faced by all, uh, regardless you are from uh, high uh, income countries or poor uh, poor countries. They they need uh, we need to uh, to deal with that. So putting that uh, uh, into priority might uh, also in, uh, encourage more collaborations. Uh, and the sec uh, second, G20 needs to include genuine commitment uh, to strengthen multilateral trading systems. Uh, uh, maintaining commitment to the WTO rules is needed more than ever. And G20 has a high, good record in maintaining uh, that kind of uh, rules-based uh, trading systems in during the uh, ASEAN fin uh, during the global financial crisis in 2008. Um, third, uh, perhaps G7 together with G20 can also start to discuss framework on the reconstruction and recovery of the post-war period. This is also the things that we uh, uh, we need to, uh, we can do together. Uh, uh, instead of just uh, focusing on the war period, we also need to look at uh, a bit more advance into the post-war period and how to do how to address the the, uh, uh, the catastrophe that we already have at this at this moment. Uh, my last point. Uh, it is also worth to underline the need for change on the approach toward global cooperations. Uh, we often see that it is not really the substance that are, which are problematic, rather the way uh, they are delivered that puts too much pressures, especially to the developing nations. So what we need is to have the leadership role 
uh, and actions on the important issues that we need to deal with, not a veto power uh, on how we go forward. So with that strong, with that stronger cooperation can accommodate numerous and sometimes different interests that, that so that uh, uh, international cooperations, global cooperations can also be more feasible. With uh, that, I end my talk uh, here, Claudia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all, to all the speakers for sticking to the time. Um, I would now open up the floor for discussion. Officially, we have three minutes left, so I will try to steal maybe five minutes from your break. I'm very sorry about that. I would ask you to raise your hand and to come forward to the microphones. Please introduce yourself and be very brief with only a question and maybe um, tell if you address it to a certain speaker, just let us know. So who would like to go first? Please go ahead. Masanori Kobayashi from the Ocean Policy Research Institute of the Sasaka Peace Partnership in Japan. I have a question to Ambassador Sotie and also Nicole that the solidarity, uh, yes, it's very important. But when I look at, for instance, the voting behaviors of the General Assembly's resolutions to condemn Russia, there are countries abstained from that uh, uh, decisions. And how could we interpret it? And of course, that includes one of the biggest democratic countries in Asia and a member of the G20. And uh, another incident, Japanese uh, self-defense force aircraft was not denied to have a landing on the way to supply uh, humanitarian supplies in the Poland, for instance. So we have to look at the concrete examples where the countries have specific actions and whether we can really see this solidarity is grand. Is it really the democracy or is it something else like economic gaps or something so i just wanted to get some feedback from you on this thank you thank you any more questions please yes in the middle please yes come forward and then immediately yeah you're the third thank you very much for this event hold today's and the opportunity i wanted to ask you when you talk especially from the german foreign ministry about uh, the secretary general agreeing in full of the united nations agreeing in full with this uh, um, against russia how can he then go back and help with the peaceful resolution because eventually we may get a short-term victory by having the secretary general fully subscribe to one position but we have to be careful uh, the g7 the g20 are only part of the g193 and we have to leave all together, they are uh, caucus groups. So, uh, and I think this was uh, clear from the last two speakers, the relativity of how the rest of the world sees this and the uh, West cannot always claim to be the international community. So we have to be careful, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Third speaker and then, yes, Tommy. So she, she gets a question to me, Hi everyone, my name is Gina Cortez Valderrama. I'm from Col Colombia and I'm the Young Global Changer Ambassador from Latin America. And I got very interested on the point that Jeff Richard was saying on how sanctions were assessed as uh, good or successful. But my question is how do we actually assess if it's good or not, considering the bouncing effects that those sanctions can have in other territories. For instance, in the case of Colombia, sanctions put it uh, to Russia for the energy supplies had an increase in the demand of the coal, Colombian coal in indigenous and Afro-descendant territory, which has now increased the human rights violations and put many leaders uh, under a really risky threat. So how do we actually assess if it's good or not, considering the, the multi- lateral or the international scene. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the final question go to Stormy Mildner, director of Aspen Institute Germany. She's my co-moderator. And uh, thank you, Stormy. And she has the questions from the chat. Absolutely. So this is, this is not my question. This is a question from the chat. And it builds up on the question we just heard. Um, and one of the participants online is asking, um, looking at the war, but also looking at the sanctions, um, there is quite a bit of pain for third countries. And the question goes, um, how much pain is acceptable and digestible and how much solidarity is needed? Thank you so much. I would like to give each speaker one minute to, to finish and to ask the question, I would start again with Mr. Thanks a lot. Um, on the Secretary General, first of all, 
Um, the only effort that I'm currently aware of to bring Russia and Ukraine to the table in order to allow for certain very, very limited confidence building measures and concrete measures for the people in Ukraine are under the auspices of the Secretary General. This is, I believe, the most important role of what a Secretary General of the United Nations can do and should do. I am um, positive that this Secretary General is passionate about this and will continue to seize every opportunity to do so. And of course, he has our support in doing that. And I totally concur, totally concur with you. Um, this requires the Secretary General to be diplomatic in the way in which he is behaving. On the solidarity here, I would like to pick up what um, Nicole J just said. Let's not um, just have a Manichaean worldview. There is not just black and white. Um, for humanitarian reasons, we will proceed as we did, for example, in the COVID crisis. We are not delivering vaccines to countries that share our political views. We are delivering vaccines to people in need. This, I think, will be the same approach on the humanitarian front regarding food security. And I believe that this is not only um, the right thing to do from a humanitarian point of view, it is also the right thing to do politically, given, as somebody has just said it, that um, besides black and white, we have amongst the um, member states of the United Nations very many shades of gray. And I believe that cooperation on practical matters will be a very, very good way of building the necessary alliance of those who support the rules-based international order. Thank you so much. I don't know, is Natalie still here? Would you like to answer some of the questions? Just, just one very brief point on this issue of uh, cost, you know, and, and sharing the cost, you know, sharing the pain in the sense of, of the war. Um, and I think a point that we have to be very, you know, crystal clear about is that the economic cost, uh, particularly through uh, the food crisis and the energy crisis, is not the result of sanctions. There are no sanctions on oil and gas. Uh, there are certainly no sanctions on grain. Uh, the reason why uh, the price of grain has skyrocketed rocketed, is the result of the war. Uh, the reason why energy prices have skyrocketed is the result of the war. Now, sanctions are aimed, successful or not successful, uh, time will tell, at stopping the war. So I think when we talk about you know, the economic costs, whether we're talking about it in Europe, whether we're talking about it at the global level, we have to be very clear that at the moment, the economic cost that is being imposed on the, war, on the world is the result of a war that Russia has unleashed, not the result of economic sanctions. Thank you so much. I think Jeff, this leads me to also to your point on sanctions and to the question. So give the floor to you. Well, thank you. Uh, the, the question uh, uh, from, from our, our colleague from Colombia was very well put. Uh, sanctions have collateral damage. And uh, I'll disagree uh, a bit with what uh, Natalie just said. Uh, some of the sanctions have affected energy trade, uh, affecting the ability to ship uh, oil, uh, the uh, changes in the, in the uh, 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 deliveries of liquefied natural gas and the like. Uh, some countries have benefited. India has benefited from, uh, from these sanctions because Russia has provided India with discounted oil uh, that India is buying now uh, in large quantities. Uh, some people have criticized India for that. Uh, but the oil remains on the market. India is getting, uh, getting a benefit compared to the world price. But many other countries are suffering because of this. And because there are uh, shortages uh, or dis discontinuities in supply chains on energy have affected the ability to get uh, 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 usual supplies uh, and have led to uh, uh, 
moving over to using uh, using more coal coal and the like, leading to the types of of domestic problems that we face. I think when countries say we are going to maximize the pain to Russia and minimize the cost to ourselves, they have to have a better view of what ourselves is. Ourselves is the international community that is needed to work together, as, uh, as Nicole said so well before. Um, and we have to take into account the collateral damage and try to minimize it to the countries that are least able to deal with it and to avoid the types of problems that our colleague from Colombia has raised. Thank you. Nicole. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, um, each sanction regime that we are aware of, as smart as it is designed, has this kind of collateral damage. So it has negative side effects. And it's all the time a continuing assessment whether the side effects are worse than the major effects that we want to implement, right? So um, this is done. And it's all the time done. So this is how governments think about sanctions. Um, I would like to, to very briefly comment on the question of um, the support within the United Nations. I was not that overwhelmed by, um, uh, by the voting behavior in the United Nations, I have to admit, because if you think about which countries have abstained and how many uh, people they represent, it is quite a portion in the world. And I think, of course, this also signals the loss of currency that democracies have uh, faced during the last, I would say, two decades. And it's imperative that um, that uh, the G7 or the, the, the group of liberal democracies are trying to convince the rest of the world again that, um, first of all, democracy is a, is a model that you want to join. That means, uh, in, for the current war, for instance, that um, um, assisting these states to alleviate the political cost of the sanctions that they see and also the political cost of the war. I would agree with Natalie that at least the increase in the cost of grain is a fact uh, of the war, not of the sanctions actually. But um, so what we need is really generous programs to help these countries live through these negative effects. And secondly, then, to also take their perspective in making them more resilient to future threats. For instance, uh, many countries in the Global South are interested in energy partnerships, in becoming a partner in transforming to renewable energies and how to become sustainable economies in the future. This is where we have to invest, make their interests our own. And then I think we will become more resilient as democracies in the future. Thank you. You see, you have the last minute. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, w whether it comes uh, uh, as the, uh, uh, as the uh, effect of the war or effect of the sanctions, the problems are real. The problems of uh, a high price in energy, uh, increasing price in energy or foods are need to be uh, deal with. Uh, and uh, uh, I think so, wh one thing that uh, we uh, can do uh, G7 and G20 can do actually to not to make it uh, even worse. Some countries already started to, for example, to ban export of uh, 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 food uh, commodities. This is uh, this is going to uh, uh, to be uh, uh, an acceptable uh, actions, and it will make the situation worse. So that uh, the the, uh, uh, the G20 and also G7 needs to uh, 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 revive the commitments toward uh, uh, toward a, a, a multilateral uh, a trading systems that uh, we already have uh, actually uh, in order to uh, uh, overcome this issue. Thank you so much to all the speakers for tackling these really difficult questions that we are facing. Thank you to the audience for the discussion and for letting me steal your time. And I wish you a wonderful next session. I think I hand over to Tina Blom from the Friedrich-Ebert-Stiftung. Sorry. Thank you.